Hey everybody, I'm Kyle Rizdahl. Welcome back to Make Me Smart, where we make the day make sense. And hello, I am Kimberly Adams. We made it to Friday, y'all. And so thank you for taking a little bit of your Friday to join us for our weekly show, Economics on Tap, where we have uh, some drinks, some news fixes, and then we're going to take a break. We're going to do some half full, half empty. Thank you to everyone who's joining us on the YouTube live stream. Which is, uh, which is active and going. What, uh, what are you drinking, Ms. Adams? Oh my gosh, I was trying really hard to lean into the St. Patrick's Day theme, but I no. randomly don't have any Irish whiskey right now, which I'll get to later. But what I did have is the final dregs of that Midori left over <laughs> from the oh, yeah. stock tales. Oh, yeah. experiment oh, yeah. of yonder and so i decided to make a cocktail with that because it's green and so my cocktail today is midori tequila and then i have some shrubs that are um what is it it's honeydew jalapeno because midori is like melon liquor and mm -hmm. then i'm garnishing it with alfalfa sprouts because they are green and i wanted to add some freshness to it so this is my cocktail today like actual, but that's a lot of sprouts. Easy, easy. Oh man, that's a lot of sprouts. Yeah, it is, but it makes All the right. drink look really cool. Well, now and I didn't. I wanted like to like garnish it with something. clovers, but like I don't have yeah. any clover, so alpha alpha sprouts was what I had in my house. All right. So. All right. So how does it taste? Mm. Sprouty. <laughs> um. <laughs> I told you there were too many sprouts. <laughs> Nobody listens to me around here, man. Nobody <laughs> listens to me. Sprouty. The drink is good. I actually sampled <sighs> it a little bit earlier. I have a, a very good friend of mine who's visiting me from Egypt. We used to work there together, and she's in town, and we're going to do all the D.C. stuff. So we were uh, sampling to make sure it was good beforehand. So this is actually good. All right. Okay. Minus I didn't pregame too I, uh, hard, I'm, <laughs> fair, fair enough. I'm, I'm just having a cup of coffee in my Puyabic mug just because I don't have it today. Uh, but uh, I was scrolling through the drinks earlier. Marvin Ramirez is having a black Manhattan. What is that, Marvin? What's a black Manhattan? Yeah, I don't know that one. I guess we can look it know. up. Let's we'll see. To see. Sarah Schlosser is having a shot of Jameson with a pickle back. No, you're not. You're making that up. Cut it out. It looks like it's rye whiskey... Amaro, Angostura bitters, and orange bitters with a brandied cherry. So I guess it's just that it adds Amaro to it, a Vernum Amaro. All right, fair enough. Oh, Sarah Schlosser is, in fact, definitely having a shot of Jameson's with a pickleback. Uh, a lot of good beers in there. A lot of good beers in there, which is awesome. Uh, I'll yeah, have let me one. See what people are uh, yeah, I know. Right, Ryan Coleman, here's the deal. I need to explain myself. I'm having coffee for the third week in a row. Number one, mm -hmm. I slept like garbage last night, and so I just don't have it this afternoon. Number two, uh, I have to go to a high school choir concert that starts at 7.30 this evening. And if I start drinking now, it is all over. I will not make it to the opening downbeat of that concert. Uh, and number three, <laughs> I have to drive. So that's what's going Fair. on. That's what's going on. I'll have a beer when I Over in the Discord, we've got Galactic Cowboy Nitro Imperial Stout. Um, let's see. I don't know. <laughs> Somebody's saying I made know. Romulan ale, which I appreciate. Yeah, that. you kind of did. Funny. You kind of did. All right. Should we, uh, should we do the news now yeah. that we're actively and we're engaging with all the comments and we're not doing the actual okay. podcast? Should we do some listening? All right. Let's news? do the you podcast. Go first this time. Uh, well, sure. Mine is uh, twofold. One of it because I was looking for Irish whiskey and recognized I didn't have any, but I have a bunch of like craft American whiskeys. And so that made me notice the CNN story about why headline why American whiskey is the real winner of St. Patrick's Day and American made whiskey is one of the fastest growing spirits in the United States with sales wow. soaring nearly 11% last year to $5.1 billion. And apparently they're doing really well on exports. And one of the other things that's drawing a lot of people to more American whiskeys is because they do a lot of distillery tours. And there are a couple of distilleries here in DC and I have 100% been on distillery tours as like an activity and then sampled the whiskeys and then bought research, bottles. Research. Yeah, absolutely, it's for research. research, for research purposes. Absolutely, it's not like, you know, or anything but anyway um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole different podcast 
whole different podcast. Mm. No, but it's really a, a fun activity to do. And uh, apparently lots of distilleries are doing it. And there are a lot more sort of craft distilleries, which is helping whiskey sales pick up in addition to uh, rise in exports. So I thought that was a fun little story. The yeah. other story I noticed was that Meta has launched its subscription service in the U.S., which would Ooh. allow Facebook and Instagram uh, users yeah. to pay for verification, just mm. like Twitter did. And, you know, it's another example of sort of what we were talking about the other day with the insulin prices, where once one company does it, all the companies do it to, right. you know, maintain competitive advantage or to follow the pack or whatever. And... We're sort of in this space. So Twitter, I saw a tweet earlier today about how Twitter has become kind of useless for following breaking news now because Mm -hmm. the, you know, it's so much of the promoted tweets and the, you know, trendy tweets as opposed to the people you follow. And I mean, I have struggled. Like usually I used to be able to go to Twitter and see like a flood of information of what was happening right now. And now I feel like I can't do that anymore. And I think Mm -hmm. that a lot of people are having that experience. And so are you going to pay for that? And then when you get to something like Facebook, which has become what Facebook is and has been for the longest, uh, are you going to pay for that? And for so long, social media has been ubiquitous because it was free. And there was zero like opportunity cost to engaging on these platforms, which not only made people say like terrible things all the time, but also kept people right. on there and, and using them more. And I wonder that as these services start to require more payment to deeply engage, what that's going to do to sort of our social media culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I look, I totally agree. Twitter has become uh, way, way less useful for breaking news. The engagement's way mm-hmm. down. It's just I'm not using it as much. And 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 that's saying something for me because I used to really enjoy it. And now it's just it's just not that. And I don't know how Elon Musk is going to turn that business around. But to the larger point on the whole Facebook, you know, monetizing thing, I think it's really interesting that the thing you get out of subscribing to, to Meta or, you know, whatever, uh, is increased access to customer service. And I sort of thought that was a business 101 hmm. that that uh, customer service kind of came with using, using the product. But what do I know? Yeah, but this has been what one of the things that's know. notorious about some of these big platforms is that you can never right. access customer service. Yeah. I ordered something from Amazon that arrived broken a while back and I you know, tried to return it and Amazon was like, you have to contact the company. And I contacted the company. The company wrote me back and they were like, Amazon is responsible for this return. Here is a phone number where you can reach hmm. the Amazon rep, the Amazon people who can help you. And it was a number to Amazon that actually got me to a real human being wow. within yeah. a couple of minutes. And I was like, I am saving this number forever. <laughs> Forever. Because whoever gets a real human. <laughs> no, no, you never do. You never do. That's so great. I thought, yeah, yeah, so increased access to customer service on a platform you use a lot. Yeah, I actually think that is probably yeah. a pretty good selling point. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair, especially if you right. use it like for a business or something where revenue depends on you being mm-hmm. able to service your customers. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so mine are, uh, well, I have two. They're the same basic story, but it's about uh, the banking situation and and I think what is going to emerge as, as a big part of this story in the next week or 10 days, which is regulatory failure. There's a piece in Bloomberg today, and also there was a piece in the New York Times last night, the gist of which is that the Federal Reserve blew it. Specifically, Gina Smilek, who's one of our Friday regulars on uh, Marketplace, but also in her day job, uh, covered the Fed for the New York Times. Um, she broke a story last night that Jay Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, uh, had maybe, yeah, it was last night, sorry, had a line about um, regulatory failure or lack of regulatory oversight removed from the statement that uh, Yellen and Powell and the head of the FDIC put out on the Sunday night after SVB went under. That is to say, Jay Powell said, no, 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 we're not going to talk about regulatory failure here, which is really, really interesting because Powell is known for being a a pretty savvy political guy. He's up on Capitol Hill a lot. He schmoozes with senators and and members of the House, and he tries to, you know, do the whole politicking thing. And this is a Mm -hmm. rare misstep, I think, for him. Number two, the Bloomberg story. So the Bloomberg story, which was out this morning, says that um, 
Regulators at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, within which SVB lay before it went under, um, those regulators started looking at SVB more than a year ago, did not sufficiently quickly raise the alarms about what was going on, specifically with their interest rate spread until earlier this year. And I think that looks bad for the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. It looks bad for its president, Mary Daly, who we've had on Marketplace. And I think the story that's going to start coming out a lot, besides the management failures at SVB and the wider contagion issue with Signature and Credit Suisse and all that, the phrase you're going to start hearing a lot is regulatory failure. Mm. A mm. lot. Yeah, it's... It's interesting, and I, and I need to do some more reporting on this. I keep hearing people that I talk to about this trying to differentiate, for the layman among us, the, the difference between a regulatory failure and a supervisory failure. Yeah, yeah. And I think that we haven't quite teased those apart enough, and I'm still it's learning about it as well. And maybe, yeah. maybe I'll do that next week. Um, I think I'm doing spots on Monday, so maybe I'll do it then. But if, um, if you are, actually, we should do that. Difference between regulatory failure and supervisory failure. That's a great idea. Yeah. And and my understanding of it, you know, which I'll share right now, is that yes, there are regulations about it, but the regulations require certain agencies to keep an eye on mm -hmm. these banks mm -hmm. and give the reg and give these supervisory agencies some discretion about how much supervision they're going to put, especially on banks in the category that Silicon Valley Bank was in, you had some discretion about how much oversight you wanted to give them. Mm -hmm. And so the regulation gave the toolkit to spot this, but the yep. supervisors didn't necessarily keep close enough eye on them and do anything right. about it to actually right. stop it in the process. So. Yeah, yep. it's interesting. That, that's a very important distinction. That'll be a good spot. We should we should do that for okay. sure. Well, I guess uh, we're going to do that on Monday. <laughs> can, consider yourself assigned. Uh, yeah. All right. So that's the news. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. Coming back, uh, half full, half empty. I guess Drew's back, but what do I know? <laughs> a lot of things. <laughs> all right. Welcome back. And now it is time for us to play our game. Half full, half empty, where we go through some events and news of the week and decide how we're feeling about it. Are we feeling mostly positive, mostly negative, half full, half empty as it goes? And uh, it is hosted by the amazing, the wonderful Drew Jostad. And Drew, let's go. All right. Are you half full or half empty on the chances of TikTok being sold? Oh, yeah, really. Hmm. That's a tough one. So, yeah. Hmm. Yes, so the story, of course, is that the <laughs> fair enough. The story, of course, is that the Biden administration, much like the Trump administration, has decided that TikTok, because it is owned by a Chinese affiliated company, in fact, very close to the government in Beijing, they've concluded that TikTok represents a national security threat for a lot of reasons. And there is talk uh, in the White House about forcing a sale of TikTok away from its giant parent company or figuring out some way to ban it in the United States. And we obviously, uh, if you're listening to the Tuesday version of this, did a whole uh, uh, episode on that with Emily, what was her name? Baker White? Some, Emily yes, somebody. I think that. She Baker was great. White, I think and she was, right. she, was, she, was, she was actually, at Forbes, mm -hmm. she was actually one of the journalists that TikTok spied on yes, to Baker figure White. out. Baker White, thank you. Uh, TikTok spied on her to figure out who her sources was. So this, it was, it was a really good, interesting conversation, actually. Um, so, Drew, hit me with it one more time. Am I half full, half empty on what? Why not TikTok being banned or forced to sell? Forced to sell. Oh yeah, I'm full on that. I'm, I'm full gonna on that. go half full also because there's yeah. such a tide of resistance. And as I mentioned, if you can judge anything from the advertising campaign here in Washington, they're yeah. pretty worried about it too. Yep, <laughs> yep, for sure, for sure. All right, what's next? Okay, a lawsuit has been filed accusing Buffalo Wild Wings of false and deceptive marketing <laughs> over calling their boneless chicken wings boneless chicken wings. Are you half full I or love half this empty? story so much. This story brought me such joy this week. Um, okay, so basically a customer of Buffalo Wild Wings 
filed an actual real life lawsuit against Buffalo Wild Wings because they found out and were sorely disappointed that those boneless chicken wings were actually gasp pearl clutch chicken breasts. Pearl clutch. <laughs> They're basically chicken nuggets. And chicken nuggets, basically. And so Buffalo Wild Wings in its response was like, yeah, it is. We also don't have actual buffalo in the wings. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I hadn't heard that. I love that part. That's great. You know? That makes it and all they were like, while. yeah. I thought it was so funny. I mean, oh my God, so great. in all seriousness, I'm obviously half empty on the lawsuit because you have to yeah. prove actual damages if you're trying to sue someone. And you can also get countersued and penalized for frivolous lawsuits. And I right. would not be surprised if this person gets and their lawyer gets hit with a frivolous lawsuit claim um, because this is standard practice as Buffalo Wild Wings said in its response is a standard industry practice and um i i it, it entertained me a lot but i'm half empty on that lawsuit going anywhere other than same half empty you know, on the lawsuit and and a half full on a countersuit because holy cow cut it out we also don't have buffalo that's great i love that <laughs> oh my lord Oh my All right. Um, All right what's next? And I will say, uh, just as an early heads up, the, our last question, because I didn't mention this at the top, our last question, we will be asking for our audience input in. So, Drew, what do we have now? Are you half full or half empty on banks' future risk taking given the Fed's new emergency lending program? The moral hazard uh, question. Yep. yep. Super interesting. Mm. So, the Fed set up and made available. Uh, bazoodles of dollars for banks who uh, figure that they might need it just in case, which is really good. The problem is that a lot of banks took advantage of that money because they worry they might really need it. The challenge, of course, is now with the Fed's uh, lending windows open and with last Sunday's announcement of the backstop of all those uninsured deposits being now insured because the troika of the FDIC, the Fed and, and Treasury have said they are systemically important. Have they de facto guaranteed all bank accounts in the United States? I think the moral hazard thing is is huge, actually. We're nowhere near done with that part of this conversation. So I'm actually going to go. I'm going to divvy it up. I'm going to go half full on banks kind of going for it in the short term mm -hmm. and half empty mm -hmm. in the long term because i think that regulators and supervisors are going to nip this in the bud i think i saw was it that yellen earlier said today that um hold on let me look this up so i don't get it wrong i believe okay. she said something today about you know don't get too excited about this because yeah. oh, yeah, it was, here's CNBC. It was, yeah. was it today? Okay. Yeah, it was yesterday. Yeah, Treasury Secretary Yellen says not all uninsured deposits will be protected in future bank failures. So I think that while they're trying to calm the crisis right now, they are going to start making abundantly clear and probably put some sort of regulatory guardrails around this to stop banks from milking it to the full extent. So I'm going to go half full for now. They're probably going to take advantage while they can, you know, just like they banked they um, bailed out First Republic. Did I wouldn't be surprised if they sort of leaned on some of that safety mm -hmm, net mm -hmm, to mm -hmm, feel mm -hmm. comfortable bailing out First Republic. Because think about it. They all made deposits into First Republic, which are now infinitely insured to mm -hmm. save that bank. So they felt comfortable in the short term for sure. But in the long term, I don't think so. I'm going to go half empty in the long term. Yeah, I agree with everything Kimberly said. I think I think uh, Yellen. It was uh, it was testimony on on yesterday on Thursday. She tried to walk it back. So I think you're actually you're absolutely right. We're going to start seeing that now be sort of crafted into a not so fast. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, all right. I love all I the comments on, in the uh, oh, YouTube chat about um, Jasper the cat Jasper. burglar because Jasper of what I shared yeah. the other day about him stealing my wallet, which he truly yeah. did. He truly did. Which, which you is saw awesome, the photo. People are Totally. I did see it. I did see it. They're totally paying attention, by the way. Uh, okay. 
So this next one is the last one. Those of you on the live stream, uh, we're going to take a little poll on this the last topic, as we always do. Kimberly and I will uh, dance around for about a minute while all y'all vote. <laughs> um, and then and then we will give you our thoughts and we will see what, uh, what all y'all think. Drew, what do you got? Okay, I'm going to start with a number, which is the February Beer Producers Index of 54, <laughs> reflecting a more positive mm. outlook for the industry. Given that it's St. Patrick's Day, are you half full or half empty? on using the beer purchasers index as an economic indicator. You're going to have to explain this because of your series, I, Kai. I will. I will. <laughs> I will. So so we, we did a series this week on uh, unsung economic indicators, and we did the cardboard box index. We did a raw materials index. And today, for St. Patty's Day, and because it's Friday, we did the National Wholesalers uh, Beer Purchasers Index. And one of the things, so beer sales in February were up, especially in the category of what are called below premium beers. Think Miller High Life, think all the, the yellow fizzy stuff, right? That I, being a beer snob, would not actually consider beer. That category was especially up. And I think the reason it's a valid economic indicator is because a lot of people who might like good beer, but maybe are feeling a little bit squeezed or a little tentative, are now shopping down a little bit. And that is, I think, a little bit troubling. So that's why uh, I think that that indicator is kind of valid. And I guess I just kind of gave it away. <laughs> Sorry. So it's it's like a box wine indicator, basically. Yeah, kinda. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's so so below premium beers are one category, right? So if you've got the whole wine category, you got you got the Grand Cru's, and then you got the good California stuff, and then you got the box stuff, right? Is that is that a fair summation of the of the global wine industry? I mean, I guess it depends on how you feel about California wines. I, I like a lot of California wines. I'm not a wine guy, yeah. so you know whatever. I like Oregon uh, anyway. wines, actually. Oh, is that right? Mm-hmm. Oregon and South American wines are, are usually my favorites. Well, you and I were the ones having the conversation about, uh, God, the Chilean wine? Car oh, yeah, Carmenere. Carmenere. Carmenere, right. I was going to say yes, Carneros, yeah, but that's very... not it. Carmenere, yeah. Uh, <laughs> very okay. good. So I am, uh, I am half full on the index. Ms. Adams, do you have thoughts? I'm going to go half full for a different reason, though, not necessarily because of, um, you know, people sort of downgrading their drinking experience, because I think these sort of small luxuries are actually places that people will preserve, even when mm -hmm. they are feeling a little pinched, because at the end of the day, even your higher priced beers aren't all that expensive. And I think people will cut back other things before these small pleasures. And so I think I might judge the increase in drinking of sort of the lower tiered beers more associated with um, <laughs> sort of depression <laughs> and sort of the, no, the winter blues yeah. and yeah. what is it? Seasonal affective disorder and also, yep. um, you know, just maybe the mental health crisis we're having in this country a little bit. I know it's a little totally bit of a downer, but um, mm -hmm. I, I don't necessarily know that I would attribute it to people pulling back because you had stories on the show this week about how despite everything, consumers are still spending and they're mm -hmm. especially spending mm -hmm. on experiential things. So it's hard for me to reconcile that people are continuing to spend on experiential things, but are going to downgrade their experience of their sort of, everyday pleasures but who knows i yeah. could be wrong i'm not an fair. economist fair. so i'm gonna go half in uh half Neither full but a different reason half full different reason <laughs> that's fair uh somebody needs to hit me with the poll in the slack because i don't know how to manipulate this thing to show me the poll that's all i'm saying that's all i'm saying we don't know I'm how to use chat gpt either well, well that's true okay there we go all right uh yeah. oh people We're... are half full also 74 percent half full 25 percent half empty with 147 yeah. votes uh, we don't as America Maxwell says uh, we don't know as Americans how to give a straight answer or to hold on to, oh, to our wallet it's very funny because Jasper. very true very true <laughs> all right I think there we go I think we have Sorry, to share this part. photo if we haven't already because Which one? I don't think people will really believe that Jasper stole my wallet until you can see the photo of him sitting there looking we'll the very guilty with the wallet so we'll, we'll put it on the show page i took a picture at the time and i sent it to a couple of my friends and they were like you've been looking for this for weeks your cat stole your wallet and i was like yes he did there's photo evidence anyway
Photo evidence. Oh, All right, righty then. Whew. Yes. So we're yes, done yes, yes. Uh, on we a Friday. It. We are <laughs> back on, we did make it on a St. Patty's Day after the end of a long week and, and a weekend, hopefully, where there will be no news. It um, was a long week. We're back week. on Monday. We but so much SVB right. stuff. So much. So much. But look, it's a huge story. It's a huge story. Huge story. Mm-hmm. Speaking of which, um, I like to think that that's part of why all y'all are here, because we do the huge stories and we do the lesser huge stories. And then we do stuff that just makes us uh, look at it and go, huh, or be interested or um, smile sometimes. And we can't do any of this without you. This is the end of our March fundraiser. We are uh, not as close as we want to be to our $150,000 goal, but we got like uh, nine more hours or something LA time. Marketplace.org slash give smart. Um, we can't do this without you. That's all I'm going to say. We cannot do it without you. Uh, we are grateful you're here, uh, and we want to keep being here. Marketplace.org slash give smart. Yes. Please and thank you. Yes. Make Me Smart is produced by Courtney Bergseeker. Today's episode was engineered by Charlton Thorpe. Drew Jobs to have a theme music to Half Full, Half Empty. Antonio Barreras is our intern. The team behind our Friday game, Half Full, Half Empty, is Mel Rosenberg, Emily McCune, and Antoinette Brock. Marissa Cabrera is our acting senior producer. Bridget Bodner is a director of podcasts. And Francesca Levy is our director, executive director of digital. Executive director. Yes. And thank you to everybody in the chat who says they have already donated. We really appreciate it. Yeah, that's true. For what it's worth, I'm actually in favor of the sprouts in the drink. You're right that there could have been fewer, but I actually think it added a nice (laughs) little freshness to it.